think of the words, I love you. Um, and I read through scripture. And uh, those aren't words that I see very, like, that I've seen from many people. You know, Jesus asked Peter, like, hey, do you love me? Peter's like, yeah, of course I do. But, like, when, when you think about, like, I think about David. And David was one of the characters in the Old Testament where he, was, he genuinely would tell God he loved him. But I challenge you, this is, this is a part of the sermon. I challenge you when you read scripture, like, look to see, like, how many times somebody says, or if they say, like, we love you, Father, we love you, God. Because it makes me feel good when my kids say, I love you, Daddy. And, um, you know, like my son, he, uh, again, like with the haircut, I keep forgetting that, like, y'all haven't seen this yet. So I've, I've had it for five, six days now. But um, uh, my son, he calls me his puppy dog now. Because, uh, no lie, when, when, I, when I go home, um, when I'm walking up the stairs to, to get to our door, I'll, be, I'll, stomp on the, I'll stomp real loud so the kids know I'm coming. And it's one of the most, like, I'm not sure how she feels when the kids are running through the house. But when I'm coming upstairs, the kids know I'm home, and they go running through the house, Daddy's home! And they're yelling, and usually one of them, they try to get to the door first and open it up. And so Ezra now, like, he's, um, <laughs> whenever he sees me, first thing in the morning when I get home from work, whatever it is, the first thing he does, Daddy, you're home! And he goes to touch my head. <laughs> he does this to my hair now. So he calls me his puppy dog because he says it feels like a puppy. And so we don't have a puppy yet, so I guess I have to serve as a puppy. Double. <laughs> um, and usually I don't do this. I don't have papers. This is new, kind of new for me. I just want to make sure I'm staying on point. But I probably won't look at that. I'll probably, I'll probably get off point. Anyways, I'm rambling. So love is, um, I don't know, it's just, it, it's, it's been hitting me, it hit me really big time when Pastor Chris started preaching on series, and, and um, the thing that I come to think of is, is like, man, like, how, how are we as a, as a church, the church body, are we, are we examples of the true Christ-like love? And, you know, I'm, I'm nearing 40, still young, still got a lot to go, a lot of, a lot of days ahead of me, and um, there's a lot of stuff that I've learned, um, one thing that I've learned, though, is that it is hard to love people. <clears throat> Some of y'all are trying to look all holy, like I'm the only one that feels that way. Some of y'all are sitting next to the one you're having a hard time loving. Don't look at them. Don't look at them. Yeah, y'all can wink at me. Just wink at me, let me know. So... But it's, it's been hard, man, and it's hard to, like, it's hard to, to, to keep loving that person or people when they continually wrong you or do things that aren't right. And yeah, and the other thing I learned, too, in the 20 years or so that I've been coming back and forth to the Outer Banks is that stop signs are just an, a suggestion. It's amazing. That's a, that's a side note for you guys to keep. Um, so, uh but yeah, it's, it's hard. It can be a difficult thing. And, um, you know, one of the um, things about love is that walking in love and walking in forgiveness go hand in hand. And, you know, the um, years ago I, I had a, uh, I feel like God showed me, um, this is what I felt like God spoke to me. He said, unforgiveness blocks intimacy with God. And without intimacy with God, we are unable to truly love people. Forgiveness, and this is the main part that, that I believe God put in my spirit, was he said forgiveness is a required element to walk in love. And um, again, like I'm not talking about, I don't want to talk about forgiveness today. I'm, I want to hit on the love aspect of it. But it, I'm just trying to lay, um, again, I'm, I'm going to lay a pretty thick foundation before we start building on it. I promise it will come all the way around. Just give me, give me time. And, um, but it's important that we're walking, and we're walking in love, that we're walking in forgiveness. And there's, a lot, there's people that I've, come in, I've encountered, that I've come in contact with, people that I know, people in the youth groups that I've been over for years, you know, they, uh, the things that I would hear is, well, I just, I hate so-and-so, or, you know, they would say these things that would, would register with me, and I would stop them, especially with the youth. I would stop them and be like, hold on, did, did you just say the word hate? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, why? You know, you're not supposed to be hating. And I, I do this in a loving way, so don't worry, parents. I take care of you kids when they're here. Um, but I do in a, uh, huh? Can't spank them. Yeah. I, I haven't given permission to do that before. Um, but, uh, 
And it's important that we instill that in the youth. Because if we don't, they're going to grow up with that mentality, with thinking it's okay to hate somebody or, or strongly dislike people or something. And that's not, that's not what God taught us. That's not what Christ taught us. And um, so like when we, when we are doing things that aren't showing love to people, like that, I, I, it makes me wonder, like, are we examples of Christ's love? Are we walking in the love that he has called us to walk in? The other thing that God showed me um, a few years back was he um, said that we never have to question Christ's love for us. We need to walk in a way that others will never question our love for them. So we never have to question his love for us. He wants us to walk in a manner where people do not have to ever question how we feel towards them. And I don't mean like, well, I know they hate me. Like, I don't mean like that. I mean, they need to know that we are walking in love for them, with them, especially in the church. I mean, it's um, it, it breaks my heart to see so much back and forth bickering and so much back and forth trash talking in the church of believers. And uh, you know, I'll use I'll try and use a quick example. Um, you know, when, when uh, President Obama, when he when he was in office, um, I would see you know on social media, you know, thank social media for making sarcasm and trash talking so much easier these days. I mean, people are brave on fa- on Facebook. <laughs> That'll preach. Maybe I'll stick on that. Y'all, I'm getting I'm getting some I'm getting some some noise now. <laughs> and uh so usually I stay away from the political stuff. I'll stay away from on Facebook. I'm like, "Nah, cuz I'm a face-to-face kind of guy." And uh there's one day I just I got so fed up, man. Not that like my post was going to change the world, but I got so fed up with all the nonsense that I was hearing, people just talking, tra- Christians talking trash and speaking ill over President Obama at the time. And, um, you know, I mean, I'll be honest, with you, I, didn't vote for, I didn't vote for him, um, but I prayed for him. I did, because we're called to do that. And um, even before him, you know, Bush, all of them, there were times I didn't like what they did. And there were times I had to catch myself before I said something I shouldn't say. But the thing that, that really got me is I would see so many people just speaking trash about him and, and speaking Christian, speaking ill things over him. And so I, I, I kind of I put this post on Facebook, and I knew that once I did that, I was going to be targets, red dots all over me, ready to go. And uh, especially for my, like, strongly conservative friends, because I mentioned Obama, like, oh, how dare you? Yeah, and... uh so I just remember on this post saying, you know, Scripture tells us that you know, there's um, the power of life and death is in the tongue. And we as believers need to be speaking life over people. Are you speaking life over him? Are you speaking life over these people? You're not. You're speaking death. When you speak these ill things about them, you're speaking death. And, uh, of course, my fellow Christians who were angry about that post, they, they didn't see that part. They just saw where I was defending President Obama. And I'll say this thing, the same thing about Trump today. All the trash talking, everything from believers needs to stop. You're praying for the man. I'm praying for him because he's leading our nation. And, uh, you know, the people that are, like I tell the youth group, I've told them multiple times, like, there's a reason why I'm, I might be stern with them sometimes. There's a reason why that I'm, I'm I'm passionate about what I say to these youth because look, you guys are my are the leaders for my kids. And so I mean it's an investment. Like I'm look, if you if you guys are gonna be my teachers' kids one or my my kids' teachers one day, look, I'm gonna do whatever I can to do my job to speak life into you and help you stay on the right track. We have a responsibility as a body of believers to do these things. And so it breaks my heart when I'm seeing when I'm seeing all this nonsense back and forth. And so you know, sadly, we, we have, you know, we, we have the answer. We do. There's a world out there of people who are dying, they're on the wrong path, and we have the answer to help them. But, you know, are we communicating that in a Christ-like manner? Or are we trying to be all high and mighty and think that we have it, you know, we, we're set apart? Yeah, like that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So when I think about this topic of love, and we'll get back on that first part here in a little, in a little bit, I think about love, when, when we think about biblical characters, a lot of times we'll, we'll go back to Jesus, right? Like we think about Jesus, we think about what God did, think about Jesus coming to the earth. 
and uh, giving his life for us and dying for us. And that's love, man. That is. And, um, but me, being more of an Old Testament guy too, um, I think of Moses. And um, I might not show it, but I'm really excited about this word. Uh, I've hit on this topic before in years past, kind of, but I, I felt like God was putting it back heavy in my heart again, again, like a few months ago. And so um, I think about Moses. So when we think about Moses, what do we think of? Ten Commandments, baby put in a basket, uh, burning bush, the Red Sea. <laughs> Flip. <laughs> um, but we, like we think of all the highlights. We think I gotta look over here because he's killing me. We look at all the highlights, and uh, but the thing I look at when I when I think about Moses and I read about Moses. Well, first um, let's let's go through a uh, condensed, uh, very strongly summarized condensed life of Moses. So he was a baby born to Hebrew parents, right? They were slaves under Egyptian rule, correct? And so there came a decree where Pharaoh was worried that the that the Hebrew Slaves were going to get to outnumber the Egyptians and that they were going to rise up and figure out who they are and then take over Pharaoh and his kingdom and kick him out and do, you know, what they wanted to do. So one way to combat that is he issued a decree for all of the, all of the male children of a certain age and younger to be killed. And that's pretty nasty. So they do all that. So Moses' mother... Um, she hides Moses for a little while, but then she can't hide him much longer because maybe the guards, the Egyptian guards, are there. maybe they're uh, zeroing in on her and they know that she's hiding something. So she fashions a basket. Some translations say it was an ark. And we know about Noah's ark, right? So Moses was put in a little makeshift ark, sent him down river, and then eventually he finds himself in the presence of Pharaoh's daughter. Now Pharaoh's daughter knew that it was a Hebrew child. But she took that child as her own and rose and raised that child as her own son. Um, now again, this is a summarized version, so I encourage you guys to read, read, go back and read this in the Old Testament. Um, so after that, let's uh, let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, Moses is a young man, and uh, he's walking and he sees an Egyptian guard beating up on a Hebrew slave, and so Moses goes and takes care of business, kills the guard, and tries to keep it secret. But it wasn't secret long because his grandpa found out, Grandpa Pharaoh. And uh, wanted to kill him. And so Moses decides to flee. He flees Egypt and he goes to a place called Midian. Now Midian isn't like, you know, going from here to Nag's Head. Midian is a pretty, is a pretty, pretty far distance between, between the two places. And so you got Moses who's gone to this place. While he's there, he ends up helping one of the priest's uh, um, daughters. And, um, you know, scaring off some bad guys. And he draws water for him and stuff. And so the priest wants to reward him. Moses ends up being gifted with one of the daughters, uh, Zipporah, and they get married. So Moses has it all together. He's got a job. He's got a family. He's got health insurance, 401K. He's good to go. He's in, he's in the land where he, needs, where he wants to be. He's content, right? He's happy. And uh, so around this time, Pharaoh dies. All the, the Hebrew slaves, they, they are, they're crying out to God, because of all this Egyptian rule they've been under, God, save us, save us. And Scripture says that he hears our cries. So Moses is out one day, and uh, he comes in, we mentioned the burning bush. So he, he comes across a, a big bush that is uh, consumed by a flame, but the, the bush is not scorched. And so God meets with him through that fire. And who do you think God sends back to Egypt? Moses. And of course, Moses makes excuses. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I can't do it because of this, blah, blah, blah. And then God counters all of his excuses and shuts them down like he does with us today, right? Let's see, y'all were loud when I mentioned Facebook earlier. And now when I'm trying to say like, well, look, when we make excuses, God counters our excuses. Okay. I mean, I cleaned my ears this morning, so I'm pretty... So... <laughs> so... <laughs> Sorry. That's an inside joke. So, um... Moses ends up going back to Egypt, and um, through a series of events, through a series of wonders, miracles done, Pharaoh finally softens up and says, okay, look, take your people, get out of here. Go. Get out. So Moses leads them out, and uh, well, then Pharaoh changes his mind, and he says, you know what? No, I want to go wipe them out. Gets his chariot, gets his armies, gets everything together. Let's go after him. They go after him. They're chasing him down. 
And uh, fast forward, you got Moses and the, and the children, um, the Israelites, the Hebrew children, they're at the, they're at the Red Sea. And right away, they're like, they're complaining. Moses, why'd you bring us here to kill us? We could have stayed in, in Egypt and been eating all the food we wanted, had a bed and all that stuff and been fine. Been doing? Oh, you cheaters. I saw eyes looking over there. So uh, you weren't supposed to pull it. So um, the really cool thing that I, that I love about, how many of you guys have seen the movie The Prince of Egypt? It's an old animated movie about Moses. And I remember when it came out, um, I really liked it. And uh, but see, the scripture the scripture says that uh, that God was with the Israelites as a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. So He's blocking them from the hot sun. He's giving them light to show them where they should go. And so when they were at this Red Sea, and I want you guys to to um, well, let's, I'm going to read it. I, I didn't give this one to you, so don't you don't have to worry about that one. But um, in Exodus 14. Verse 19, it says, Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So you have, you have the, uh, the Israelites. They're at the Red Sea. They don't know what to do next. And they see this army behind them. They think they're going to die. And it's like they forget that there's this pillar of fire, like cloud above them. Now, how can you forget that? And so anyways... What happens is, is, and this is why I like part of the, the Prince of Egypt movie, and in that movie it shows like the pillar of fire like flies back, it stretches all the way back to where the, the, um, the Egyptian army is, and it creates this massive firewall to where like they can't get through, and the Israelites, you know, they, they have time to, to do what they need to do. Um, so I don't know if that really happened, but I like to think it did because I think it's cool. So verse 19, then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was a cloud in the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near them all the other night. Coming near the other all night. So, um, and this is a whole other sermon in itself, but a lot of times when we were moving forward with Christ, and we think the enemy's chasing us down, we forget that, look, God is that pillar that can separate. He can, he can put that wall up. We put so much focus on the enemy. He doesn't deserve our credit. We get so devil-focused that it messes up what God's trying to do in our lives. Is that okay? This little, this little side road we went down there. So, all right. God tells Moses what to do. Stretch out your arm. Get ready to see a miracle. So Moses does it. Parts the Red Sea. They go through. And then uh, when they get out into the side, um, by this time the pillar is lifted. The Egyptian army follows them through. When Moses and everybody gets out, God does, does what he wants to do, and boom, brings the Red Sea on top of the Egyptian army, and they're done. There's a lot more to Moses, but I just want to kind of give that, um, give that little breakdown of who, um, a little background of Moses. Now, Moses, this is why I think about him a lot when I think about love. Moses risked his life multiple times for the Israelites. He did. And again, I encourage you guys to go and read. If you don't like the Old Testament, look, please dig into it. There's so much stuff in it that, that is good. So um, he risked his life multiple times for the Israelites. They complained so much. When things did not go their way, when they came to the Red Sea, they complained. When they got hungry, they complained. They were like a baby, crying. And when they got thirsty, oh, we have no water to drink. They, they complained. And they would always go and complain to Moses and Aaron. They would complain to them, like, oh, what, why did you? And this is what they would say. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? This is almost the same thing they would say every time. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? You brought us out here to kill us and our children and our livestock and, and all this other nonsense. And that's what, I mean, it's like they were trying to lay this guilt trip on Moses. And every time, God bless you, and every time Moses would intercede for them because God would get tired of it. And there was a few times when God sent, he took out a number of Israelites, um, killed them. And then Moses had to come and intercede for him. God, let your wrath be, you know, don't, don't take them out. Like, just let's handle this. Let, let's, work, let's work through this. And, and he did. And um, so... One particular time when these guys wanted to complain about something, 
I mean, we're, we're on the same page, right? Are y'all with me? Yeah, we're good? Good? Good. Good. Facebook. Amen. I'm messing with y'all. Y'all get the point. People complained against him, messed with him, and just got in his head, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, it would have gotten in my head. How long do you think you could have been, that you could have put up with all that? Because it wasn't just once, it wasn't just like once or twice, it was multiple times. Multiple times. Every time something didn't go right. They were thirsty and they came to an area where there was water, but it was bitter. Well, God took care of it. He sweetened the water and they were able to drink it. God sent them bread, manna, meat. He, covered, he gave them what they needed when they needed it. Another time when they were thirsty. Oh, we have no water. Okay, well, there's a big rock. Moses, go, go take care of it. And water comes shooting from the rock for, for them to drink. Cool stuff. And so they go on their journey a little bit farther, and oh, they come to another spot. Oh, we're thirsty or hungry. It's like they forgot everything that God had done before. That God wouldn't take care of their immediate need. And we do that a lot, right? We, we as in we, not just me, but we as in we. We see God come through in a certain area of our life, and it boosts our confidence, boosts our faith. We get excited, and then the next day something else happens. Oh, God, I don't know if you're going to help me on this one. That's what we do. I hope that I wouldn't be like one of the Hebrew children at the time, but I probably would have been. I don't know. So again, we're laying a foundation here. Why do you think Moses invested so much into the, into the, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew people? He loved them. God gave him a task to free them. And Moses wasn't the kind of person that was going to go free them from Egypt and just leave them. And that was something that, they, that Moses had to explain to God at one point when God wanted to take him out. He's like, God, you freed these people from Egypt. You can't just wipe them out, and then all, all of your enemies are going to know, like, oh, that's how God takes care of his people. I wonder, like, and again, I've told you guys before, I'm, I'm a behind-the-scenes, I'm an in-between Scripture kind of guy. Like, I like to, I wish, I want to know, like, the in-betweens here, the behind-the-scenes stuff of Scripture, because we don't know everything. Everything's not in here. So I wonder, like, when Moses was with God, like, what that was like the conversations that just those two would have with each other. So I had you guys in Numbers. Um, numbers 21. We're going to read verses 9 through, I mean, I'm sorry, 4 through 9. So this is another opportunity for uh, the Israelites to complain, to get on Moses' bad side, to get on God's bad side. And... Uh, So they journeyed from Mount, Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes with worthless bread. Stop there. Now, like bef before this happened, God had, God had already delivered them in a battle from the Canaanites. He took care of them. And so, again, another opportunity where they've got to care of them, and now they're, they're whining about something else now. So, our soul loathes with this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on the pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Uh, have you guys ever read that part of Scripture? That's awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love the Old Testament. So um, let's break that down a little bit. The people spoke against, who to say they spoke against? God and Moses. And when you go back and read the accounts of the Israelites, Unless I'm wrong, if my research is bad, I only ever see them complaining against Moses and Aaron. This time, they're calling out God. They're, so they're complaining against God and Moses. 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water. Now, see, this is where I think it's funny because, all right, they journeyed from Mount Or by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. They're complaining about no food, no water, but yet they're right there at the Red Sea. If God could turn bitter water sweet, if God could bring water from a rock, he can make the Red Sea drinkable too, right? What do you think? Yeah. And then the food. Oh, there's no food. Oh, but wait, there's more. Our soul loathes with worthless, worthless bread. He's giving, them, he's giving them food what they need, but now they want to complain about something. So they're saying they have no food. They're saying they have no water. But yeah, it's right there. It's right there for them. And so maybe God had enough of it, so he sent the serpents after them. This is where, like I told you guys before, I, I like to put myself in, in the shoes. I try to put myself in the shoes of the person that we're reading about. Um, and so Moses, I, I try to think about what was going through Moses' mind. You read about Moses, what he did. He left Egypt. God called him back. He went to, to free the people. That's what God wanted him to do. Moses did it. And countless times he interceded for the Israelites because he loved them. He was a true leader. He loved them, interceded for them so that God would take care of them. And so I just, I begin to think like, because I asked you guys a while ago, how long would you guys have been able to last with all that? How long would you have been able to put up with all the complaining and the nonsense? This is why when I, when I said earlier, when I think about love, I think about Moses. Because love isn't just a one-time thing. Oh, I love you. Okay, see you later. No, this is a thing that every day we have to walk in. And this is Moses walking in this every day. And there were a few times Moses was kind of upset, and he had his, he had his conversations with God about it. And, but he got straight, much like all of us when we get mad and we talk to God and we think, you know, we're shaking our fist at him. And, and then we're like, okay, wait a minute, you're right. And so I think about, we're on the same, are we on the same page? Like, are we, you got Moses. God gives him this command, like, look, I want you to go. I want you to build, get, get you a, a serpent, a fiery serpent, put it on a pole. And I want you to, to, whoever who is bitten by a serpent, when they see this, they're going to live. So what do you think, I mean, what do you think is going through Moses' mind? Like, do you think he's just casual? Okay, how do I do this? Do I turn the tail here and make it? And how tall of a pole should I use? Like, I mean, do you think about, maybe it's just me. Do y'all think about that stuff? I think about things like that. And I think, and so you got to think, like, this, this is an immediate need that is happening right now. It's an immediate, this isn't like something like, okay, God's like, you got a few months to build it and you can handle things. This is something immediate because there's serpents running rampant through the, through the camp, biting people. So that's why I ask, do you think Moses is being casual about it? And I'm going to encourage you guys, just like how to put yourself in the shoes of Moses right now. If you got to close your eyes and kind of visualize it, do that. Put yourself in his position, what he might be going through. And so I, I, I envision him like just finding whatever he could, and those who weren't bitten, maybe he asked Aaron, like, look, I need this, go get this, and he's making all that, like, look, get what I need, we got to get this thing built now. People are dying. People are dying. And he gets this pole with this serpent on it, and God told him that if people see it, they'll live. Moses loved these people so much that he wasn't going to let them die. And so I, I envision just Moses grabbing whatever he could, getting, I better not do that, I might knock something over. I don't know. He gets a pole, and he's holding that thing up high. And I, I wonder, like, I mean, God didn't say put it somewhere. He just said, or like place it in the ground. He just said, look, get it up high, and if people see it, they're gonna, if they're a bit, they'll live. And so I envision Moses, you got to think about people there. How many of you guys like snakes? Not many of y'all, right? When I told my wife that there were poisonous snakes in the Outer Banks, she began to rethink our move here. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, she's one of those, like, you know, any snake, any, a dead snake is a good snake. Um, <laughs> so, and so think about a bunch of fiery, ser- fiery, a bunch of serpents going through camp biting people. Are y'all going to be sitting right here? What are y'all going to be doing? Going, scattering. You know we're in the camp. And so again, think about what Moses, this isn't some little light task where Moses is like, okay, guys, 
There it is. Look what I made. Facebook picture. Hashtag. Fire servant poll. That's not what he was doing. He made this thing, and I, and I envisioned him like, I mean, and I'll stay up here for because of the video, the camera and stuff, but I wonder if like he was chasing people down. Like he saw somebody run outside, no, he'll go after them with this pole, like yelling at them to look at this thing. Because people are panicked. How many of you guys have been in a panic mode before? And you're like, you don't, you're not thinking straight. I'm sure word was getting around to these people. Everybody like, hey, Moses has this thing. If we look at it, we'll live. But they're so panicked, they're scattered. And so that's why I see Moses chasing people. Why? Because he loves them. Look at this. Look at this thing. It's going to save your life. Are we good? That's what I see. When I think about love, I think about Moses chasing people with a fire serpent on a pole. I never heard that one before, huh? <laughs> that's what I think of. He loved them. God gave him a task that he needed to complete. When I think about all of that, and I think to myself, like, man, it can be so extremely hard to love people, to keep loving people even when they wrong you, to keep loving people when, when you feel like they don't deserve your forgiveness, to keep loving them when, when just things are not going the way that you think they should go. We are called as a people of God to walk in love through it all. You don't agree with somebody? Look, don't comment on our Facebook post. Don't put an angry face on our Facebook post. Pray for them. I think about another man in the New Testament who was born to Mary. You got Jesus who came to this earth, fully God in the flesh. And he knew there had to be a ransom paid for our sin, right? And I think about what Jesus went through. I think about the betrayal. He was betrayed by one of the ones that were supposed to be closest to him. I think about the fact that when he was arrested, he was beaten, he was ridiculed, he was mocked, beard ripped out, all these different things. He, was, he did all of that. He went through it all. He was crucified. And all the while, while he was doing this, while all the while, while this is happening to him, he is still loving those people. He is still forgiving those people. This is a conversation I have a lot with a lot of the youth that I've, that I've helped to, to teach over the years. Because a lot of the youth would come to me, well, I just, I hate my dad right now, or I hate this person. I, I just can't forgive them right now. And, and my, look, my, my strong encouragement to us in this room, we have no right to hold on to unforgiveness. If you are a believer, if you are a Christian, you have, well, I mean, nobody really, but especially believers, you have no right to hold on to, forg to unforgiveness. And I would use, that, I would use that, that example, and I would tell these youth, look, you can't, you got to think about what Jesus went through. And even when, when he did it, when he was crucified, all the while he was forgiving those that were doing these things to him. And what, somebody spread a bad thing about you around school, and you're going to get mad and hate them and not forgive them for that? We got to learn to walk. Now, look, it's a process. I understand that. It's a, it's a process for all of us. We have, to, we have to learn to walk in it sometimes, and it takes time. But going back to Moses, the pole, the fiery serpent, it wasn't a matter of a few months. We're like, hey, okay, you got time, Moses. You got time to make this work. We may have a little bit of time, but our responsibility, just like how Moses was with that pole and that serpent, Jesus was crucified. He was held up high. Now, he's no longer on that cross. But our responsibility as believers, as Christians, we are to point them to Jesus. 
We are to hold him high like Moses. Now, I'm not saying chase people around out of banks. You know, Jesus, <laughs> I'm not saying do that, but you know, if that's what God told you to do, I don't do it. We'll see what happens. But uh, make sure you record it. Do Facebook Live, something, so I can see what happens. But I think about a world out there of people that are dying. They were bitten by the serpent, and they're dying. And they need to look on Jesus. That's why I said earlier on, like I wonder, like I just, I, I have to question sometimes the love of certain believers, certain Christians, when they say they love somebody, but yet they're speaking hate, they're speaking death over somebody. And I have to wonder, like, man, if, if I wasn't a Christian, would I be drawn to Christ because of what I'm seeing in the church today? Would I be drawn to Christ because of what I'm hearing certain people say? What I'm seeing Christians on Facebook, I know I keep saying Facebook, I'm waiting for some amens on that one. But all, all the, like, I'm waiting, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm seeing these things and I'm wondering, would I be drawn to Christ if I wasn't a believer? And I don't think I would be. I know people who stay far away from churches because of stuff they see, because of the nonsense they see. We have the answer. We have the poll. We have, we have the answer but yet, okay, are we, are we communicating that in a Christ-like manner where people know, like, hey, I mean, most of those in the world today don't know, they're, don't know they're, they're dying. They don't know that they're on a bad road. So we're, we have been tasked with, with the, the time. We have been given this responsibility to go speak to them, to show them Jesus. And so just like Moses holding that pole up, I feel like, man, we need to be pointing to Jesus at all times. But we get so caught up because, oh, so-and-so said something bad about me. Or, oh, well, my car broke down. Why would God do this to me? Right? Oh, the Internet's not working. I'm angry. I laugh at stuff like that when people are on the <laughs> I mean, Leanne, I know my phone, my phone's old, but Leanne, she'll tell you, like, there's times where, like, it takes forever to do anything. I'm like, come on! And I'll get a little upset sometimes. But then I kind of, I hone it, I'm like, man, I hone it in. I'm like, well, I mean, technology is amazing. So, okay. 20, yeah, Moses didn't have this. So. You know, my concern for today's youth is, um, I mean, I would go as far as to say they have it a lot worse than what I had it. There's a lot more opportunities out there for them to make bad choices. And we, as, as um, speaking to Christians in this room, we as believers, we have a very strong responsibility to help lead them in the right direction. Because a lot of them are looking for those who are going to help build their self-esteem those who will give them the time, those who will give them the, the, the attention. And if they're not getting it in the church, if they're not getting it from those who should be teaching them the ways of God, they're going to get it somewhere else. So it's important for us, like how are we living? How are we, how are we showing the love of God? Real quick, um, in um, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained uh, mercy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So this is Peter encouraging people, like, look, make sure everything you're doing is honorable in God's sight. So that when those who don't know God will see the way you're living, and maybe, just maybe, It'll help them make the decision to follow after Christ as well. 
I've said this to, to my worship team, to the media team. I've told them, that, look, you know, we, we've got a responsibility as, as one leading this church in the worship and, um, you know, doing what we do up in the media booth and all that stuff. And, and the, the, the comment I made to, to our teams is this, look, people are watching you. Not just inside this church, but outside these walls, people are watching you. They know. And so it's like we have a heavy mandate on us to live like we were, like in a Christ-like manner. In, um, in John uh, 17, this is actually one of those, um, this is one of those passages where I've, I've been working on something for a few years. Um, I love this one, this is one of my favorite chapters. But if you have, like in your Bible, you might have like the little subtitle things like Jesus prays for himself, Jesus prays for the disciples, so forth. So this is where you know, Jesus is praying for, he's praying. And uh, in um, verse 20, after he finishes praying for himself, praying for the disciples, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through, your, through their word. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The Pharisees and, and those who didn't believe in Jesus, they couldn't see. Look, Jesus, when he looked in the mirror, he saw God. They were one. They were one. He had a hard time convincing a lot of people that, look, I am God. And so when, when I see this, that he wants us to be one with him as he is one with God, I, you know, I, I wonder, like, man, I wonder if, if up in heaven, like when Jesus looks in the mirror, he's seen each one of us. When we look in the mirror here, are we seeing ourselves or are we, you know, what do we see? But I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So how are we? How are we living? Are we pointing people to Jesus? What the words coming out of our mouth, are they bringing life or are they bringing death? Are they directing people to Jesus or are they pushing him away? What are we saying? That word means, that word is heavy to me, through their word. We can't just be like, okay, Jesus, come fix it. I said something dumb, come fix it. No, we need to be ready. Our words need to be full of life. And we'll, we'll end with this on John, in John 13. Uh, verse, before I do that, um, again, we have a responsibility to point people to Jesus. And um, the last few weeks, I, I talked to you all about, and before worship, I would encourage you guys, like those who are having bad dreams, those who are having bad thoughts coming in, and all, you know, all that stuff, don't hold on to those things. You've got, you've got the ability to, to, to counter all that stuff. Because a lot of times when we have a bad dream, when we wake up the next day, we think, oh, well, my day is already shot. Well, that's you giving up. And I've, I've found myself multiple times in the last three weeks or so when I, when I have awoken from a dream and I get up and I'm like, man, I don't really want to do a whole lot. But then as I heard when I was a young Christian, I would hear these like, these... These preachers of old be like, I grabbed myself by the scruff of the neck and I got myself going. I got my spirit man. My spirit man was beating my flesh up to move. And, and um, I'm not saying I did that, but I began to just thank God. Thank him. Like, thank you. I mean, that's what gets me going. I just thank him. Thank you, God. It's a new day. Thank you, God, that you're good. Thank you, Father, for your provisions. Thank you for covering me, God. Thank you for all your goodness. Thank you that you never leave me. That's what gets me, so look, find your, thank you, find out what it is that gets you into that presence with him. When you feel like you can't do it, you can do it. You have, you have self-control. That is a fruit of the Spirit. You have it. One of the dreams that I had years back, and I'd forgotten about this until I was kind of going back over some old notes, I had a dream about my dad. 
And I thought I wasn't going to tear up, but I am. Uh, my dad, who uh, he is 72 now, I think. And, um, you know, he, uh, my mom passed away nine years ago. My dad is, you know, he's that, he's that southern man who, you know, he's, he likes his solid, he likes to be the solitude. He likes being, he don't like people very much, <laughs> but um, he does. I mean, he wants like people who are like-minded, I guess, but, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, I've tried to find opportunities all throughout the years to, to, to speak Jesus, speak about Jesus to him. And I found out you know, after my mom died, um, my dad's sister, who is, she's like a hardcore Mennonite. She's awesome. <laughs> she's not afraid to be like, you need Jesus. <laughs> I love that woman. Um, she told me one day, she said, you know, I don't know what happened to your dad. When he was, you know, when he was younger, he was all in it. And I had no clue. Look, because I, I didn't, I wasn't one of these guys who, who sat down. I got three older brothers. Um, I'm the youngest, so I got beat up all the time. And, uh, but I'm now the second biggest, so they don't mess with me as much when I see them. So um, I flex my muscles and they leave me alone. But I have one, I have one brother who's like six foot nine. He don't, he don't scare easily. So, um, but like I never sat down with my mom and dad and was like, you know, like, hey, how'd y'all meet? Like, you know, you know I, I, don't, I didn't do that. And uh, my wife, I learned so much about my parents. After we got married. <laughs> oh, no, we were dating. We were dating still, yeah. And uh, I remember I was, like, doing something outside or in, in my old room, and I came out, and she's sitting at the table talking to my mom and dad. And I'm hearing the story about my dad walking by a diner, seeing my mom. I'm like, what are you talking about? I've never heard these stories because my dad, we just didn't have those conversations. And, uh, like, the one thing we had that was, that was ours was fishing and camping. That's what we had. My dad would wake me up sometimes, sometimes on a school day. Wake me up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Hey, boy, want to go fishing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we'd go fishing, sometimes go camping. And um, we would be on the boat fishing in, in the lake for hours. And the only conversation we'd have is, you hungry? <laughs> yeah. Here. <laughs> he'd toss me a pack of hot dogs or something or some bologna and some crackers or sardines or whatever. And... Um, but see, to me, the conversation with my dad was fishing. It was camping. That was our conversation to me. It's doing so good. I didn't know... <laughs> I didn't know God at this time when we were camping and doing all that stuff. I had no idea who God was. And I began to pray when I when I became a Christian. I, I prayed for my mom, and my dad, like God, you got to bring them, bring them in. And um, so when uh, my mom died. I, uh, of course, I spoke at the funeral, and um, believe it or not, I didn't cry. <laughs> um, I was sad. I was hurting. But I had such a peace that I knew where she was. And um, so uh, my, my aunt, afterwards, you know, she was... Again, she wasn't afraid to tell people they needed Jesus. <laughs> and uh, I remember her telling my brothers, y'all need to get right. You need to get right. I remember her telling my dad, you got to get right. I said, man, I wish I could talk to them that way. It wasn't much they really, because you know, I was a younger brother, it wasn't much that they would listen to with me. But I was amazed, though, at... Um, uh, now, I'm, I'm trying to wrap this up. I really am. Are we good? I was prophesied over when I was 20 years old that I had a spirit of Joseph. And I didn't know what that meant. Um, 
But you read the story of Joseph. Joseph pretty much saved his entire family. I mean, he was he's he was the one who he was the youngest, one of the youngest, and the brothers didn't like him because he was cocky about the dreams God gave him, and and uh, you know, I mean, Joseph meant well, but um, down the road, all of his brothers looked to Joseph, and so when I got to Texas, um, after my mom passed away. My dad went to go lay down, and so my, it was just myself and my brothers. And I said, okay, what's, what's the plans? What's going on? And they're like, we don't know. We're waiting for you. I'm like, why? Because we don't know what to do. I'm like, I'm, I'm the youngest. I'm the youngest, and you guys used to beat me up, give me wet willies, and try and put my head in toilets and stuff. <laughs> like, and now you're looking to me for answers. And uh, I mean, I, I didn't do it like I didn't say it that way, but you know. <laughs> um, so I remember, like, I was the one who made the calls, had to make, had to arrange everything. And while I was doing that, I, I was reminded of that word I got when I was 20 years old, 21 years old or so. I'm like, man, God, is this like just a glimpse of what that word was? And um, so, <clears throat> I'm fast forward now because I, I I can't hang on that. My family needed me, and because of what I went through with my family, like thinking that I couldn't speak about Jesus to them, I began to see little glimpses here and there of, like, okay, God's given me opportunities to share with them about who God is and share with my dad about who God is and all that. And, and so I had this dream like six or seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. It was after my mom died, I believe, and, and uh, in the dream, my dad came to me. And my dad was, like, desperate. And he was, he was, I mean, he just was, like, in my face, like, son, like, who is this Jesus? Who is he? Like, I need to know these answers. And he's asking me all these questions. And, and in a dream, like, I'm looking at him, and I'm like, I couldn't say anything. I said, I could say nothing to him. And he was, he was looking at me with desperation in his eyes. Who is this Jesus? Who, who is he? And I couldn't say a word. And I woke up in tears. I mean, it was a dream, but I felt like I failed my dad. Kind of wishing this wasn't being recorded right now. Humor is my way of getting out of certain things. You haven't figured that out. My dad had this, this look of desperation in his face like he needed to know who Jesus was, and I had nothing to tell him. And I woke up just crying. So I think, again, we have the words, we have the answer for a dying world. Are we keeping our mouth shut? Are we doing things that are making it worse? Or are we speaking to this world in love? Are we showing them the Christ-like love they need to know and see? John 13, verse 31. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him and himself, and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That verse alone always puts things into perspective for me. Am I walking in love? Are people going to know who he is, who he is because of the love I'm walking?